when someone accidentally threw away the school play costumes. Oh, no. Replacements were shipped with FedEx. And with picture proof of delivery, everyone could focus on the perfect opening night. FedEx, where now meets next. For residential delivery only. If your roof starts to leak or your floor's really squeak, you live in a money pit. Money pit. If your basement needs a pump or your place looks like a dump, you live in a money pit. Money pit. Pick up the telephone, fix up your home sweet home. I call an 888 Money Pit. The Money Pit is presented by DAP Spray Texture and Dice Coatings. Now here are Tom and Leslie. Coast to coast and floorboards to shingles, this is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. And we are here to help you take on the projects you want to get done around your house. Trying to take on some projects to get done before the end of the year, before the holidays. We can help with that. Want to plan a project for the year ahead. Want to get through the winter by paying less for energy than you did last year. We can help with that too. Frankly, we can help with just about anything you need to get done around your house. But you have to help yourself first by reaching out to us. Two ways to do that. Easiest thing to do is go to moneypit.com slash ask. Click the blue microphone button. You can tell us your home improvement question and get the fastest possible response. Or you can call us at 1-888-MONEYPIT. That's 888-666-3974. we got a great show planned for you coming up this episode, if your closet is looking a little messy, closet organization may be in order. But that's one project that ranks right up there with getting dental work done is something to look forward to. So we're going to share some step-by-step, or shall we say shelf-by-shelf tips to make this job easy to tackle. All right. And also ahead, most homes have cracks in the walls. That is a fact. But how do you know if a crack is minor or is one that spells serious troubles if you're not repairing it correctly? We're going to find out when we welcome Bob Brown, the author of Foundation Secrets. And if you own an older home, you might have a window in the shower. Very typical with older homes, but not so much with newer ones. But the water, the wood that get along that window, never a good combination. So we've got some tips to prevent windows from rotting and growing mold. But first, are you dreaming about a project that you'd like to tackle this fall? Well, maybe there's a big to-do on your list that you got to get done before the friends and family show up for the holidays. Whatever it is, guys, if you can dream it, you can do it, and we can help. So let us know what all of these dream projects are, big or small. We can lend a hand. Reach out to us right now at moneypit.com slash ask. Just click the blue microphone button. Anna in Delaware is on the line with a painting question. What can we do for you today? Well, uh, we painted around the bottom of our house, the foundation, with cement and sand. Okay. And what I want to know, can we, you know, paint over that with regular paint, or would that bleed through? The cement and sand mix is like a stucco mix, right? And is that, is that, is that sticking to that foundation? Is it breaking off in any way, or is it still solid? No, no, it's in good shape, but I, it, I, I, wanted to, I really wanted to paint it. Some of the neighbors painted it, and they looked nice. Would it would it be okay? Okay, so what what you need to do is you need to prime it first. You need to use a masonry primer. That's really important. But you have to sand that out. No, as long as it's intact, okay. Yeah, it's in good shape. Yeah. Then you need to prime it first because the primer is what's going to make the top right make the top layer of paint stick, so to speak. So you prime it first, let the primer dry really, really well, and then you can put on the top coat of paint, exterior quality paint on top of that, and it should be fine. But just remember, you know, after paint comes repaint. So once you paint it the first time, you're going to have to paint it again and again as years go by. Yeah, okay. You put the primer on first. That's the key. Make sure it's primed. Okay, use primer first. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. All right, Anna, good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Bill in Ohio, you've got the Money Pit. How can we help you today? I have a uh, wood-burning fireplace, and it has a brick firebox, and I'm going to put gas logs into it. And I'd like to clean it out as best I can before putting the gas logs in. And um, there's soot, I guess, and creosote in it. I wonder if there's any uh, good way to clean that off off the brick. You know, there's actually so there's a ton of different products out there, actually. You can try 
it really depends how much is caked on there because they all kind of work differently. First might be starting with like a TSP, which is a trisodium phosphate, but that's generally going to only work for not that much of a buildup. And since you're talking about the interior, um, try that. The TSP you can find in you know any of the home centers in the paint prep aisle. You mix it up. You can make it more of a thicker paste, and then you put that on there, and then you can brush that off or clean that off and see if that will do it. There's a couple of other things. Um you know, many of the stone companies will make something called a brick and stone cleaner or a fireplace brick and stone cleaner. You can find it online if you search for those exact words. You can even go to, I know my local Ace Hardware has one that's in a tub. It's called a soot remover. There's soot erasers, but I think that, again, is only going to really work for a little bit of a buildup. But because you're on the interior, you might want to go for the heavy-duty stuff. All right, yeah, I tried sodium uh, or baking soda. You sort of paint it on, and it, and it actually did a fairly good job, but there's just some areas that are just a little more resistant to that. And you have to remember that, you know, that brick surface is very absorbent, so you may not end up getting it all out. But as long as it looks kind of even, I think you'll be good to go. Now, you also mentioned you're putting in a gas log here. Be very careful that you have proper venting for this gas log because they throw out a lot of BTUs. Now, in some cases, what you might want to do is actually physically wire the damper open and then maybe put doors on this so that the damper could never be left shut uh, by accident. There have been so many tragedies when those dampers have been left shut with gas logs where people have uh, suffered horribly from carbon monoxide poisoning. So you need to be really careful to make sure you're not creating an unsafe situation. I'd rather see the damper be wired open so it can't be shut. Then you can put a pair of glass doors on that fireplace to keep the drafts from getting into the house. Okay? Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. You know, we love hearing from our listeners. And if you want to make our day, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You know, it really helps us know what we're doing right and how we can improve our show for you. So just go to moneypit.com slash review, moneypit.com slash review, and you might even win a copy of our book. All right, now we're going to Tennessee where Jean has a stucco question. What's going on? How can we help you? Well, the house was built in 1914, and the outside, the exterior walls are covered with stucco that has the kind of swirly bumps where they swirl the trowels on it. And it looks like it's in good condition. So I was thinking we could probably just spray it a nice color. It's still kind of golden like it used to be, but wherever the branches of the shrubs went against it, it's kind of yucky and gray looking. Mm-hmm. But I know that when, you, uh, when we painted our patio slab, we had to do some treatment to it before we could paint it. Does stucco need some preconditioning besides just hosing it off with soap and water? Well, the first thing you need to do is to make sure that there's no algae attached to it. And so I would probably do a very light pressure washing and cleaning of the outside of the house and let it dry for a good couple of days in warm weather. And then I would prime it. Uh, with an oil-based primer, and then I would use a good quality exterior top coat paint over that. You can't cut any corners here. You can't take any shortcuts. But if you do it once and you do it right, it's going to last you a long time because that siding is not organic. You may find very well that paint can last you 10 to 12 years as opposed to maybe 5 to 8 if it was wood. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. All right, John in Texas is on the line with a question about new heating and cooling for his money pit. What can we do for you? I wanted to find out some information on these uh, ductless heaters and the air conditioning instead of using the uh, conventional furnace heater and air conditioning. So are you talking about uh, heating units that get mounted like on the wall, for example, that are just sort of space units but permanently installed? Yeah, they look like regular heaters and stuff like that. I just wanted your thoughts on it. John, what room in your house do you want to have these heaters in? I want to put them in every room and not use the furnace anymore. What's wrong with the furnace and the air conditioner? I just don't like them. You just don't like your furnace? Okay. Yeah, I never have liked them because, you know, when we first had a furnace, we had one that was uh, a gravity furnace and uh, heated up the entire thing. It didn't seem like it used much energy. And then they made you turn from coal to gas 
and you had to add electric to that because it wouldn't push the heat. So it's more expensive. Okay, so first of all, I think what you're going to find is that if you use space heaters, that collectively they are going to be more expensive than the central heating system. And if your central heating system is uh, making it very expensive to heat your house, the problem is generally not the heating system. It might be the house itself in terms of the insulation that you have in the house. And the best place to look for that is in the attic. If you had to choose one place to add uh, some energy efficiency to your house, it would be the attic by at least doubling the amount of insulation you have there. Most people don't have this much, but you need 15 to 20 inches of fiberglass in a house for it to be reasonably energy efficient. I know what you mean about the old gravity fired, uh, the gravity fed uh, coal furnaces. They're really big units uh, and they're really hot and they do fill the whole house up uh, quite nicely. And then maybe now, uh, especially with those older ducts using a more modern furnace, you're not getting the distribution you want. But I don't think that's the issue, and I don't think the solution to space heaters is I think uh, collectively you're going to end up spending a lot more on uh, on those than you would on the heating system you have now. So I would tell you to try to improve the energy efficiency of the home and not replace this, the uh, heating system itself, John. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Well, if your closet is looking a little messy, closet organization could be on your to-do list, but that is one project that ranks right up there with dental work. It's something that you really aren't looking that much forward to, but a completely organized space might not be that far off. Well, to begin, you got to have an idea of how you want to use the space and what you want to store inside of it. It's going to be a store. Is it going to be a storage area? Is it going to be a place you keep everyday clothes? Or is it really just going to be a spot where you keep formal or off-season garments? You know, once you figured that out, it's an important part of the plan. Then you take everything out of the closet and toss, donate, or sell what you don't want, you don't need, or you don't use on a regular basis. Now, it's time to organize your closet next and select the components that are going to hold all of those belongings that you want to put back into the closet. So what you choose and how much you spend is definitely going to depend on your design priorities and the amount of closet space that you've got to work with. You also need to remember that a great closet system can be a positive selling point if it comes time to sell the house. People love organized spaces and love being able to put their stuff in a specific place that's already prepped for them. So good on you for getting this project done. And the nice thing about closet organization today is that there are so many different components that are available at home improvement stores that can make organizing your closet a very fun DIY project that's going to give you incentive to keep your newly organized space neat. Now we've got Christine from Ohio on the line, and I think she's got a lot of questions for us here at the Money Pit. How can we help you? So my first question is about the garage insulation. Our plans call for an uninsulated garage and we got some estimates on spray foam, and so I had him give me an estimate on the garage. I was wondering how much of an investment should we put on the insulation in the garage, or is it worth it at all? So is this new construction, Christine? Yes. Okay. Yep. So garages don't have to be insulated uh, by building code. Usually the only the only part of the garage that would naturally be insulated would be the wall between the garage and the house. This is an attached garage? Detached. Oh, detached. Okay, so then it would have no insulation. So the only reason to insulate this is if you in the future decide that you're going to want to heat that space. And if it is a detached garage, that may very well be the case, and it's never going to be easier than it is right now to insulate that space. In terms of the insulation choice, since it is new construction, I would definitely recommend that you use spray foam insulation because it's very effective compared, much more effective than fiberglass. It also stops any drafts that are going through the walls. Okay. So my two cents would be I would definitely insulate that garage and I would do it with spray foam, you know, before it's all finished off because this way you'll be good to go. Now, on the inside of that garage, if you're going to put spray foam on those walls, you're also going to need to cover them. So think about that. You don't want to leave that spray foam exposed because they'll just get beat up over time. Right. So you could put on, you know, any type of wall board. I would maybe lean towards a fiberglass wall board. It looks like drywall, but but it's a little bit harder and it doesn't grow mold because it's outside. Oh, okay. And in the crawl space of the house where we have the addition, we were going to get spray foam. Should we just get it on the garage? 
on the joist or should it go all the way down the cinder block? Well, typically it, it definitely goes on the underside of the of the floor joist and in, most importantly at the box beam, which is the outside right above that foundation. But the foam would not go down below that. If you do want to insulate the crawl space walls, there's a different type of a, sort of a fiberglass batting that's used for that that's con- it's contained inside of a wrap, usually has like a foil face. And that's going to work better for the that small section of fiberglass of uh, excuse me foundation wall. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome, Christine. Very exciting. You're getting a new house, and we're glad that we're able to help you make the right decisions for it. Yeah, good luck with that. Yes, thank you so much. Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones. Your friends and family can spend it on their favorite Apple services, including Apple subscriptions. Apple Gift Card can be used to buy all things Apple. Products, accessories, apps, games, movies, TV shows, iCloud Plus, and more. Visit apple.com for details and to send Apple gift cards to your friends and family this holiday season. All right, now we've got Daniel in Washington on the line. Daniel, welcome to the Money Pit. What can we do for you today? Well, you can help me figure out why my wife takes a cold shower and I take a hot shower. (laughs) I bet she's not too happy about that either. She's very unhappy, and and she seems to think it's my fault. (laughs) (laughs) So who goes in the shower first? She, She goes in first? She does. And it, and it, what, it takes a long time for the water to get hot? Well, she turns it on. Uh, our our bathroom shower is about, I guess if I added up all the pipes, maybe 30 feet from the water heater. So it's not very far. We've lived in the house for 12 years, so we can usually we can usually count on hot water coming about four seconds after we turn on the water. Right. And it's not happening this time. She'll leave it on for a minute or so. It's still cold. And she says, what the heck? I, I need to get, uh, get going. So she takes a shower. And then she screams and yells at me. <laughs> and then it's all your fault. 20 minutes later, after she clears out of there, I get in there and the shower is nice and, and warm. Well, that's an odd problem because it's certainly it's not the distance. That's very, very short. Now, as far as you know, is your water heater working normally? So if you go to your kitchen sink, does it deliver hot water pretty quickly? When we turn it to the left, it's hot. And when we turn it to the right, it's cold. All right, so the kitchen sink is fine. And the kids' bathroom is fine. Okay, so it's not the water heater, it's not the pipes. What's left here? The shower valve. You've got a bad shower valve. You came to the conclusion pretty quickly that it's not the hot water heater. Somebody suggested that it's some dealy bobber inside the hot water heater that has to kick over. By virtue of the fact that your water heater delivers hot water to your kitchen sink and delivers hot water to your kid's sink, it's only not delivering hot water to your uh, master bath sink or shower, right? It does deliver hot water to the master bathroom and the master bathroom shower, but it takes, I don't know, 10 minutes or so after my wife goes in there. So what, one theory is that we're by, by her taking a cold shower, but having the knob, the nozzle turned to the right, to the left, where it would give hot water, it activates something. Okay, so let me ask you. Let me ask you one one more question. In your in your master bath room, you have a sink, correct? Yep. And does that sink get hot quickly? Sure, but maybe not. Maybe not first thing in the morning. Well, does it take as long as the shower to get hot? I haven't tested that. All right, so test that. If the sink gets hot quickly and the only plumbing fixture in the house that's not getting hot quickly is that shower, then you've got a problem with the shower valve, and that could happen. Something could break down inside the shower valve, and it might be that it takes so long to run before it finally lets some of that hot water in because maybe you're waiting for uh, one of the pipes to, one of the valve parts to expand and just something is jammed shut, and it's just not letting the, the hot water out. So I suspect if you've eliminated... Everything else is is normal. It's just that shower that's not. I'd replace the shower valve. It'll probably save your marriage. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least my hearing. There you go. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Well, most homes have cracks. You know, that's a fact. But whether it's a wall, a floor, or even foundation, some number of cracks are, are more common than not. But how do you know if a crack is minor or one that's going to spell serious trouble if you don't correctly diagnose and repair it? 
Well, Bob Brown is the author of Foundation Repair Secrets. He spent decades working side by side with engineers and scientists to understand why foundations fail, and he knows when it's time to panic. Bob, welcome to the program. Great. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. You know, panic is what people do when they see even the slightest crack in their homes. But some number of cracks, like those on walls and ceilings, for example, are pretty typical in every home, right? Yeah, some cracks are fairly typical, especially in unair conditioned areas like garages. And and on the outside, you're going to get thermal cracks. So, And almost every home has cracks in the floors, all concrete cracks. You can't stop concrete from cracking. Well, now, if you do see a crack, though, what is like an indication that it could be structural compared to, say, something that's just cosmetic in the sense that it's not really going to cause harm to the building? Yeah, so there's actually three categories of cracks. There's uh, structural, serviceability, and cosmetic, and almost, almost no cracks are structural. In other words, structural from the strict sense of the word, meaning that it could provide it, it, it endangers the home from structural collapse. I've almost never seen that. Almost all the problem cracks are either cosmetic or uh, what they call serviceability or functional cracks, which have to do with they, they open and close a lot. They make doors and windows not function right. They let pests in. Those are the kinds of things that cause problems. And and uh, foundation repair companies around the country try to kind of obfuscate that a little bit and tell everybody that, oh, yeah, this is a structural issue uh, when they're not even structural engineers. It's a lot of scare tactics. Now, when it comes to foundation cracks, do you find that the soil type affects a foundation more than another, like clay versus non-clay? That's right. Cl- clays are usually the problem soils. Now, you can have settlement from sandy, uh, gravelly soils, and that's a one-time event that eventually, over time, unless water is added, uh, they they kind of stop over time. But clays, they can expand and contract, expand and contract, and they can cause a lot of problems over time. You know, I live here in the Northeast. I spent 20 years as a professional home inspector, Bob, and one of the types of cracks that we typically see up here is one that's caused by simply by gutters, gutters that are overflowing or downspouts that are discharging water against the house. And that water just soaks in right at the foundation perimeter. It freezes, it expands, and then over a number of years, it starts to crack and open up that wall. It kind of like you get a parallel crack with the floor. It might start small, but uh, it can get open to, you know, three quarters of an inch or or more. So do you think maintaining good drainage and, and, and the such is really important to maintain the structural stability of the home no matter where you live? You no. Know, uh, in addition to owning a foundation repair company, I owned an engineering company. And almost every report we tell everybody, drainage is key. It, you know, not only put gutters on your house, but, but hard pipe it 20 feet away. Uh, those, are, those are the key things to remember. So, Bob, how do you know who the right person for the project is, or at least for guidance, when you do see cracks and you do suspect an issue? Is it an engineer? Is it a foundation repair company? How do you know where the conflict of interest might be? Where do you start? Well, having owned both, I can tell you for sure that you should not call foundation repair companies for two reasons, mainly. Number one, uh, their salesmen are 100% commission. And so they're going to try to find something to sell no matter what. And number two, they're not qualified. They're not engineers. They're, you know, and it really, when we're talking about engineers, we really mean geotechnical engineers. Those are soil engineers. Structural engineers, they're not all that helpful in these situations. People call them a lot, and they they show up to the house, but they're not really all that helpful. A geotechnical or forensic geotechnical engineer is who you need to call. You know, the advice I've always given our listeners and and my clients before that was that if you have a serious crack, that you should be calling an independent structural engineer for that crack to be reviewed. And if a repair is required, have the engineer specify exactly what has to be done to make that repair. At that point, you can take his specification and go out to foundation repair companies and don't ask them what they think, because frankly, at this point, you don't really care. What you want is a repair company that was going to follow the advice specified by the engineer. And then once that's done, make the final step, having the engineer come back and certify that it was done correctly and there's no further cause for 
any concern. And it also makes sure that the foundation repair company only gets paid when the engineer signs off on it at the end. This is sort of protects you as a consumer. It also gives you sort of a pedigree that if uh, sometime in the future the house goes on the market and an inspector like me goes in and says, huh, this wall was repaired. What happened here? If anyone presented me with those documents, I would tell my clients I'm very satisfied with the quality of the repair and they got nothing to worry about. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Tom. Uh, quite often, the consumers will call out three different foundation repair companies, and they get three different plans. And it, they're not experts. How do they know which one's right? Maybe none of them are right, right? Because none of them are done by engineers. You make some great points. Bob Brown is the author of a brand-new book called Foundation Repair Secrets, and he also is a guest contributor to MoneyPit.com. You can read Bob's post on MoneyPit.com with more tips and advice on how to address these sorts of issues within your own home. Bob, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with our audience. Good luck with the book, and have a terrific day. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Well, if you guys own an older home, you probably have a window in the shower. I know it seems weird, but that's just the way they built homes back then. And by older, I'm not talking about like 100 years old. I mean, it could be a house that was built in the 70s, which there's a whole lot of those out there. So if you've got that, trying to keep the water away is not easy. And if you don't keep the water away, you can get some serious damage as well as mold and rot. And if it gets really bad, I've seen it get into the wall studs, the insulation and the siding. It can basically be a real mess. Yeah, it can definitely turn into a real mess real fast. Now, there are a few things that you can do to keep moisture at bay and then prevent it from spreading. First, this one's fast and inexpensive. It involves sort of hanging an additional shower curtain inside the shower, but Definitely don't do the whole wall where the window is. Just do the window itself. And you can cut the shower curtain to kind of fit into that window opening. So don't be afraid to make like a teeny tiny shower curtain. And you use like an adjustable tension rod. So, I mean, especially since that shower curtain is not going to be heavy. You don't need a lot of support there. So you can get a tension rod, set that to the opening of that window itself, and then trim a shower curtain to cover that up. And that's going to help you tremendously. Now, another idea is to simply re-slope the windowsill to prevent water from pooling on that flat surface and seeping inside the wall. You can remove the wood sill and replace it with tile that's sloped downward towards the shower so it will drain. You can also remove the wood sill and trim and replace it with PVC, which is great because it doesn't rot. We're talking about products like Azek. It looks like wood, it cuts like wood, but it does not rot like wood. Now, sometimes the best option long-term is to actually just replace an existing wood window. Ideally, that window should be fixed, not openable, and made of vinyl or fiberglass because both of those are water-resistant instead of wood, which definitely is not. Now, glass blocks are another option because they bring in natural light into the shower, they give you some privacy, and they offer better protection against moisture. And definitely... Glass block does have an 80s vibe to it, but I always feel like in a bathroom that 80s vibe kind of goes away because it's appropriate for the space. Yeah, you get a lot of light and you get all the privacy. Now, whichever option you choose, be sure to check the seal around the window regularly and dry that windowsill after each shower. If the problem persists and there's already damage, it may be time to remove the window completely and then close up the space after repairing it or certainly replacing the window with a more modern one that's going to be properly installed and simply not rot. It's a bigger job, but it'll definitely solve the problem once and for all. Stephen, North Carolina, you've got the money pit. What can we do for you today? I've got a cabin way out in the woods here in North Carolina, and I built a uh, bathroom onto it. And uh, this years ago that I've done this, we put a flat roof over the bathroom and the seam um, leaked during the last uh, storm very, very badly. When I removed the uh, tiles and I used, you know, the pink insulation in the roof, what do I do? So all that has to be torn out. Now, you mentioned it was because of a storm. Uh, is this cabin insured? Do you have a homeowner's policy on this? I do, yes. You know, that storm damage should have been covered by your policy. Yeah, if you haven't filed a claim, I would definitely do that because it's probably covered. Now, since you had such a bad leak, obviously all that has to be taken out. So you've removed the ceiling. You have to pull out all that insulation. You need to wear appropriate breathing protection when you're doing this and try to control that area because with all of that mold, you don't want it to get into the house, right? So that's why it's kind of a job for a pro. But, I mean, if I was doing it, I would depressurize the room I'm working in so that there was good ventilation and everything was like blowing out, right? So... 
I would make sure that um, I manage that. Pull out all the insulation you're going to need to spray down all of the inside surfaces with a mold inhibitor. There's many good commercial products on the market that do that. And you're going to have to replace that roof. Now, uh, you said it was a flat roof. That's the least favorite type of roof, I would say, because, you know, it's, uh, it, it, if there's going to be a leak, it's going to happen a lot quicker on a flat roof than any other kind of pitched roof. But you're going to have to replace that. What kind of material did you use? Did you use roll roof on, on it? We did. And uh, see, and I, that was, that was my mistake. Yeah. Roll roof is not designed for flat roofs. Roll roof, you got to have at least about a, about a 212 pitch for it to work right. And so, you really need to use a like a rubberized bitumen or something like that, but choose a material that's designed for flat roofs when you replace this. But I think you know it's ahead of you, Steve. You just needed me to say it. <laughs> you got to tear it all out and uh, listen. If you can, uh, if you can get uh, coverage because of the storm, maybe it won't cost you as much as it might have. Okay. Okay. All right. Listen, good luck with that project, Steve. Listen, and, and before I let you go, I wish y'all would let the trailer music play. A little longer. I love your music. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much. We appreciate that. I got to put that on the website. A lot of folks love that too. Really? Everybody loves it. You don't even know we have like additional verses to it. <laughs> oh, I want to hear the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Tiffany from Ohio wrote into Team Money Pit and she says, We have a slow running drain in our bathtub. I bought a bottle of chemical drain cleaner from the local store and followed the directions. The water now drains faster than before, but when the tub starts to drain, I hear loud gurgling sounds. What would cause this noise? The house is about 25 years old. So you may have cleared part of the clog, but you may have revealed another problem. The other problem is that you have a blocked vent somewhere. So if part of the reason the drain was slow is because the vent is clogged, um, that's why you're getting the gurgling. The water's still finding a way through, but it's sucking air instead of through the vent pipe. It's kind of, it's taking it back through the drain. So you're going to need to either live with that or you're going to have to have a service come out and clear it because that's the only reason you would get that kind of gurgling. All right, now we've got Michael who writes, we have a metal roof and like seeing the rain running off. If I put a medium pound rock where the rain falls, will that be sufficient to stop erosion or should I put plastic under the rock as well like making a dry creek? Well, it's probably best to add weed cloth underneath the rocks, but I'd be concerned about all that water sort of potentially impacting the foundation. Another option would be to run a curtain drain under the grate and catch that runoff, and then you can drain it farther away from the foundation. This is a much more effective way to add a drain than what you're thinking of. I would look at the products that are made by Easy Drain. They are sort of a combination drain with some pebbles that surround them and a filter cloth, and they're really easy to install compared to a traditional curtain drain, which requires stone and filter cloth and all those other kinds of stuff to be put in in layers. I think that'll be a great solution to enjoying your metal roof and catching that water and moving it properly away from the house. Yeah, I bet that's really pretty to watch that rain fall down. I like this solution, Michael. Enjoy those rainy days. Well, you might not even realize it, but one of the most common home accidents is a fall. Well, Leslie's got tips to help you avoid the slips in today's edition of Leslie's Last Word. Leslie? I know we said fall guests, that kind of thing, but falls and fall, it all is very common this time of year. You know, it really is one of the most common household accidents that send Americans to the ER. But did you know that a third of all of these home accidents you can actually prevent There are simple things that you can be doing right now to decrease those chances of you and your family members from taking a tumble. For example, if you've got throw rugs, get rid of them. You want to make sure area rugs are held down with double-sided tape or skid-resistant padding underneath them. I can't tell you how many times we see area rugs when we go visit friends and family that are just kind of willy-nilly hanging out on the floor, and they are super slippery. So if you have somebody coming into your home, Maybe you're comfortable with that rug that way. You know it's there. You know how it reacts. But somebody who's just stepping in the door once a year, twice a year, they're not going to know that. So definitely make sure you secure those rugs down. And you also know your way around the house very well. You know the spacing. You know the layout. But guests are not going to. So rearrange that furniture for clear, wide pathways around the house. Now, think about your lighting. You know, today's LED lights, they provide a much better quality of light than incandescent bulbs. And you can install night lights and you can use the highest wattage bulb that's approved for those lamps and light fixtures because, again, 
guests don't really know their way around your house and they're not familiar with how everything is. So give them the best advantage. Bright lighting, good task lighting, adjust that. Also, uneven steps. Again, you know them. You know which step going down to the basement is the tricky one, but other people don't. So tighten up those loose railings. Be aware of trip and fall hazards around the house. Let's just try to keep your family safe so we could all have a wonderful holiday season. This is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. Coming up next time on the program, one appliance that you might own and you'll never want to be without again is your garbage disposer. But during the holidays, disposers get jammed more often than any other time of the year. If that happens to you, there's no need to pay a plumber double time and a half. We'll tell you about a super easy way to get it back in action on the next edition of the Money Pit. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. Remember, you can do it yourself. But you don't have to do it alone. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account, where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.